This is my first Reddit post and it's gonna be heavy. It's gonna contain mentions of physical and mental abuse so this is a trigger warning for everyone. I'm an 18-year-old female and met my ex who was a 22-year-old male in February of 2020 but didn't end up dating him till closer to my 17th birthday because he still lived with his GF. He told me they were just friends and he didn't like her like that, and I didn't find out till later that they were actually still doing things together and meeting him was the biggest mistake of my life. Everything started off great as every relationship goes. I sent pics cause he was my BF so you know and of course I let him save them for later use. Which was another big mistake. I noticed that they were still texting and when I went through his phone he was saying he still loved her and missed her. I was deeply hurt and called him out on it. He apologized and said it would never happen again and I told him to text her that we were dating and he did. She. Was. Pissed. She stopped paying for the house and helping him with car payments and at this time he had quit Taco Bell and refused to do his new job Ubering because I need to practice League of Legends because I want to be a pro league streamer. So I worked my ass off and ended up losing my job because the manager didn't let me work without a doctor's note so I was stuck working his job while he played his games. Before I met him I had 4.5 B thousand in my savings, he ended up using my card to pay his phone bills, car payments, the apartment, daily weed, fast food, new league accounts, and freaking CSGO knives. He kept losing his accounts due to telling people to off themselves and using the F and N words. B but the worst was yet to happen. I found that he was using an old tablet to excessively watch porn, set up dating accounts and have different Instagram accounts. But on these accounts he was pretending to be a woman. I called him out about this and told him I wanted to leave. He freaks out jumping around and screaming and crying saying he would change and I trusted him. As time went on things got worse and I was scared to leave and by the end of this you will see why. He had shoved me into a wall and gotten in my face screaming, you stole my car key because you don't want me to work because you're jealous of other girls, which was stupid because he had thrown his car keys at me during a different argument. But one day I went through the iPad and found that he was actively not just sending but selling my pictures from when I was 16 17 and doing the same with his other ex. I started to try to get my stuff together and put Gorilla Glue in the charging port to just get rid of the filth I just saw. When he found out that it no longer charged after he used my car to get his food. He. Was. Livid. He started screaming and getting in my face. I tried to go around him and grab my things, but when my back was turned he pulled me down to the ground, wrestled me till he was able to put me in a chokehold. I was sobbing and just accepted that this would be the end, but before I blacked out he let me go and I started gasping for air and gagging from excessive coughing as he just stood and laughed at me. I tried to crawl away from him when he grabbed my leg and started dragging me out of the apartment. I kicked to try to get him off which just made him pull me like a dog playing tug of war. He eventually dragged me out, keeping my wallet, keys, and all of my valuables so I sat crying begging for my stuff so I could just go home. He came outside and pulled me down the apartment stairs by my leg and I was left with extreme bruising and some cuts. I did end up calling the police and they did absolutely nothing. Fast forward he had to move because he had nowhere to stay or live after getting evicted from the apartment and I had gotten a new job. One day it was particularly cold and I went to get a shirt out of my car and there he was. Sting in my car on his phone. I left the door unlocked usually because I worked in a good area. I called him a cheater and told him to leave. He got out of the car and was starting to go around the back so I jumped in and tried to lock the door from the back seat. He ran over and pulled the door open and started trying to pull me out of the car. I started screaming and kicking at him, thankfully a customer saw this happening and called the police. They arrested him and told me to go home for the night which they ended up firing me for. Unfortunately, he got bailed out and while he was in jail he had given out my phone number to other people there. He walked 4.5 hours to my house after he was released and was looking around my backyard when my neighbor saw him and called my dad. My dad got in his truck with his gun and waited for him to come out of the gas station. He eventually did but ran off he wasn't shot. He had harassed me saying that he was going to show up to my graduation and ruin everything and has gotten to the point of making multiple fake accounts on Snapchat, Instagram, and TikTok pretending to be me and his other exes. As of today January 1st 2023 he still pretends to be high school girls selling our pictures and making fake account. Hell Lou. I just came across this subreddit and gosh some of these are terrifying. I do have a story of something that happened to me from a long while ago, but in hindsight it was really dumb of me and I feel terribly dumb now, 
so I've always been hesitant to tell a lot of people I know about it, except for my psychiatrist lol. And I always apologize for long posts so it's so hard not to hear. There were some other conversations I had with this man named John, it was mostly him talking, but I left some of them out for length's sake. This was a few years ago. It was pretty late, definitely past 2 am. I was living with this boy who was pretty abusive, and he had gotten really jealous at this party we were at earlier that night. Not even an hour after we had gotten home, he tossed me out onto our front porch and locked the door behind me. I was knocking and pleading for him to please let me back inside, I was still wearing what I had worn to the party and it was freezing out. I wasn't sure what to do, he had my phone, purse, and wallet in the house with him so I just sat on the porch crying. When he turned off the lights both inside and outside of the house, I knew he wasn't going to let me back in. I felt so helpless and cold. I thought about knocking on a neighbor's door, though he didn't have many, but I had anxiety about waking any of them up and causing trouble for my boyfriend. So instead I decided I would try to walk to this gas station and motel, which was like a little less than a mile away, so I could use their phone to try to call a girlfriend of mine to see if I could sleep over with her. Ironically enough the road I was walking on Donner Pass Road so the freezing cold was fitting, but anyway, a little bit into the walk this tall white pickup truck was approaching on the opposite side of the road that I was on. I tried not to make eye contact for obvious reasons, but then I heard the truck stopping and beginning to make a U-turn and my heart just started pounding. I just about froze up but forced myself to speed walk at the very least. The truck pulled up to me and this guy rolled down his window and asked what I was doing out this late. I told him how I was going to meet my friend at the gas station and that she was expecting me. He sort of smiled and offered me a ride. I said no thank you, saying that I shouldn't hitchhike. He told me, well good, I don't pick up hitchhikers, or anyone. You don't look like a hitchhiker though, you just look like you need some help. He just kept driving next to me and told me I shouldn't think he was a creep and he pulled out what looked like a police badge and told me he had just gotten off duty which is why he was in civilian clothes and out so late. He said he wouldn't mind driving next to me just to make sure I got to where I was heading safely. I was naive and a bit too trusting of his kindness and credentials and when he offered me a ride again I said that it would be nice because the gas station wasn't that far away anyway. He popped the door open for me and I hopped in. The radio was low, it was a little messy, the estray was full of cigarettes, there were a lot of newspapers on the passenger floor. As I was moving my feet some of the papers shifted showing a pair of handcuffs, some coffee cups, empty water bottles, rags, a highlight colored bandana, and some other things. He apologized saying that it was the truck he took hunting, but it was super warm so I was happy and didn't mind at all. He told me his name was John, he asked why I was scantily dressed without a jacket and I started to tell him about the party and the fight I had been in with my boyfriend. He was super charming and attentive, he even laughed that he could go back and arrest him. I asked about him and he told me about his family. He was a young dad, he had a wife, a daughter, a son and a dog, and I told him it was like he had the perfect little family and he laughed and said he certainly did. Then it sort of clicked for me to ask him if I could use his phone, but he said no because he had to save his battery. We were approaching the gas station and he drove right past it. I politely said, oh, I think that's the one, but he didn't answer me. I felt sick to my stomach. My heart started pounding. I started getting choked up. My eyes started tearing up as I was looking out the windows and watching the lights behind us getting further and further away. It was hard for me to even speak but somehow I murmured, asking if he could please turn around and he ignored me. Whenever I would look at him he just looked empty eyed and emotionless, totally dead and glazed. I looked back out the window and down at the road to see if maybe we were going slow enough that I could make a leap out of the car without seriously injuring myself. I remember always hearing, never go to the second location, but I thought about the possibility of jumping out and breaking an ankle and how it would be a lot harder to get away with one foot as opposed to two, debating with myself that there was snow on the ground, but then again, snow is hard to get along in, especially when you're not fully clothed. I feel so dumb now too because I wasn't even tied up or anything, I was just so scared though. Like there was nothing but trees, an empty road, and us. I was crying pretty badly at this point and asked if I could please borrow his phone again, I don't know why I even asked, and he told me to stop talking. Then he started talking underneath his breath saying, girls shouldn't be out so late. You shouldn't have been alone this late. Look what you're doing to me. Dressed like a slut. And other derogatory things. As he kept saying these terrible things, too many to type out here, I wasn't even responding, I was just crying and trying to think past the fear I was feeling. 
I remembered the pair of handcuffs I remember seeing under the papers beneath my feet so I used that little I don't know how to describe it, like, scoopy motion. I managed to use my feet to scoop the handcuffs up and use my heels and toes to push them under the bottom of my seat, as far as I could. I was thinking of different things I could do to try to help myself, like if we were close enough to some upcoming lights or structures, if I ever made it to them, I could just grab the wheel and cause us to crash into them, or maybe how if I got lucky enough for a cop to pass us, I could grab the wheel and swerve so he would appear to be a drunk driver and we'd get pulled over. I guiltily thought about the possibility if this man is just having a weird night and how if I did anything it would hurt him, but I told myself that sort of thinking sort of got me into this mess. He pulled off road where there were still woods on both sides of us, on his side the wooded trees were closer to the road, on mine, but there was a small gap fully covered in thick, I don't know how many feet of snow, before the trees thickly picked up maybe 10 to 16 yards away. He turned off the car and coldly said there was something wrong with the car and to get out with him. As he grabbed the keys and was stepping out of the car, I grabbed onto the center console and cried and pleaded not to make me get out with him because it was too cold. He turned around to face me, his door still open and shouted at me to get out of the car because we had to go check out the trunk bed hatch. I dug my fingernails deeper into the console, thinking my cries of no and head shaking would cause him to come around to my side of the car and drag me out himself. I was crying and said, please John, I'm so cold and scared. I was thinking of everything I ever heard, humanize yourself, use first names. He stared at me in this way. I can't even describe it to this day, I don't even know how to start. He got back in the car and I slinked towards my window, scared he would drag me over the console. He turned off the headlights and everything just looked dark blue. He stared at the steering wheel for what felt like years before lighting a cigarette and looking out his window and back at me and then back out his window. He heard me shuffle my feet on the newspapers. I was just adjusting my legs, but while still staring out his window told me if I thought about running, he had a quick way to get me where he wanted me. And oddly enough I was sort of thinking of running minutes before that, but reasoned that if he wanted me out of the car then I should definitely stay in, otherwise he would chase me or shoot me, in case he had hunting rifles in the back, I didn't dare look, I'm glad I was right. I think at that point I sort of hit some sort of bottom of my reserve and instead of panic, there was numbness and exhaustion. There were still an occasional hot tear or two, but I just remember being numb. I talked to a psychiatrist about this sort of thing and he thinks it just came from my ex-boyfriend's giving me PTSD. It was dead quiet but I finally just barely audibly told him that my friend was still waiting for me and asked about his wife and children and he flatly said he didn't have a wife or children and that his house was empty. I asked him what he was thinking about and he said, I'm thinking of what to do with you. He didn't say it angrily. He just said it flatly and coldly which sort of scared me more. I did start getting worked back up to a cry, at that point and he told me not to cry and turned the car on offering me some heat. I just cried and said I wanted to go home. Eventually, he started driving, and kept driving until we were approaching a gas station. I was gauging the right time to reach for the wheel but before I could, he started slowing down. While pulling up, he told me not to tell anyone or he would find me. Then he told me all he was doing was teaching me a lesson not to hitchhike with strangers. He was almost coming to a complete stop, when he told me to get out before he changed his mind. Before he could even get another look at me to assess my understanding, I was already down out of the truck and sprinting towards the gas station. The panic was overwhelming me but then I stopped and remembered to try to see his license plate. I turned around but only caught the blur of the last three numbers as he was driving off. I ran inside and asked the clerk behind the counter to please call the police. I waited until the officer got there and I'll be honest I was a little scared it would be John. My fears melted away when the new-faced policeman got there. I gave him the description of John, his appearance, the vehicle color and type, the parts of the license plate number I had caught, the fact he said he was an off-duty cop, just basically anything I could. I asked him if he could look at the camera and the officer disappeared in the back for a little bit then came back out saying there was nothing on them. I asked if I would be able to look and the officer said no and asked me if I didn't trust him and I told him of course I did. The officer gave me a ride to my friends lecturing me for hitchhiking, consisting of him repeatedly asking if I knew who Ted Bundy was, of course I knew, I was just naive to think it could never happen to me and I was desperate for some warmth. I never heard anything back about the report that was made so I would try to follow up and each time I did, they never got back to me aside from this one time I was told my case number didn't exist, but that didn't stop me from trying to follow up. Throughout the months and years I asked my friend, 
whose home I slept over at that one night. If she ever heard of any weirdness or anything since that incident had happened to her or anyone up there and she always says no. So I sort of let it go and tried to tell myself that maybe he actually was just trying to teach me a lesson or something. I mean I definitely never hitchhiked again, so if it was a lesson, it certainly worked. I never heard anything back having to do with the case, I never heard of any other odd experiences up there, maybe it was just one man trying to teach me something. But honestly sometimes I think I tell myself all of that to help me sleep better at night. It all felt really real. Even if it wasn't real, I'm really glad I didn't get out of the car in the woods that night. This has also been super therapeutic to let out, so thank you so much for letting me to post here. Dot. Edit. I'm not really the biggest fan of a few of you trying to inbox me saying you're John, so if you could maybe not that would be super neat, thank you. A little over a month ago a friend of mine decided to leave her abusive husband after 20 years. Now, I haven't known this friend for even a year yet. We met at work but instantly clicked. Plus when you meet someone who has been through the same kind of things you don't have to go into details because they already know. The weekend before she left they came to my son's birthday party. This was the first time I'd ever met the man aside from seeing him when he come into the store. Some things to know about me, I live in the middle of nowhere, like it's 30 minutes into town that only has two red lights and a Walmart in the middle of nowhere. I have been through hell with my ex-husband to the point I have a no contact order where he's not ever allowed to have any kind of information for or about me. Also my Facebook is set to where unless I specifically give you the link or you knew me 20 plus years ago you'll never find me. So that Friday I go into town and get cigs and some other things and my friend tells me she's leaving that day. She's not taking her teenage children because both of them act just like their dad plus would have told him exactly where she was at. She was also turning her phone off. That literally was the only information I had. I told her to be careful and let me know she's safe when she could and then went home. About 930 that night I'm at home alone when all of a sudden my doorbell rings. It's her husband. Colin, is my wife here? Didn't even use her name. Me, nope. Colin, do you know where she's at? Me, nope but if I hear anything from her I'll let her know you're looking for her. Colin, I don't know why you're hiding her or won't tell me the truth. Her boys are distraught that she's gone and killed herself. Me, push my door open. Do you want to come in and search because she's not here and I don't know where she's at but if I hear from her I'll tell her you're looking for her. He calls me a cunt and walks down the steps. He proceeds to sit out in front of my house for almost 10 minutes. He then pulls around the back side of the area by the lake and sits there for who knows how long because I left to go get a friend to come stay with me for the night after that. A little after midnight I get a FB message from her youngest son asking if I know where she's at. I told him the same thing that no I didn't but if I heard from her I'd tell her they were looking for her. He says thank you and that's it. Now having her husband show up at my house and her kid finding my FB set my anxiety on edge and I didn't sleep much that night. So I was awake at 6am when her oldest son messages me on FB demanding to know where his mom is, telling me I better not lie to him or else. I told him the same thing I'd been saying. He proceeds to tell me his dad filed a missing persons report and the cops were coming for me because I was hiding her. A little after 7 I get a call from a number I don't know. I normally don't answer numbers like that but hoping it was my friend I answered. Me, hello. Person, Angel, this is Sophie's sister Michelle. Do you know where my sister is? Me, no but if I hear from her I'll tell her everyone's looking for her. Michelle, when's the last time you saw her? How was she acting? Was she on anything? Me, saw her at work, she was acting fine and no she wasn't on anything. She proceeds to go on about the cops and the call ends. A little later Sophie messages me. I call her and fill her in on everything and help her make a three-way call to law enforcement to talk to them. I'm heading back into town to get gas because I'm leaving for a few days when my phone rings. It's mine and Sophie's former store manager from where we worked. Kate, so I guess you're wondering why everyone's trying to get a hold of you so badly. Me, no. No I know. Kate, well, I gave all of her family your number because I know you know something. Remember that no contact order I mentioned earlier. This thing risked it all over something I had absolutely nothing to do with, sorry. I hung up because then I started shutting down, went into a full-blown panic attack when I found out shortly after that that this thing had posted my number to her Facebook telling all of Sophie's friends to reach out to me for information. This is long so I'll try to sum this up. What has proceeded over the last four weeks is being accused of hiding her, breaking up her family. I was originally a crackhead, 
then I got upgraded to a meth head. I have been harassed, threatened and sexually threatened. Her husband has stalked my house, broken into my house and all of this after they were told by law enforcement she did this by choice on her own and I had nothing to do with it. I have reports with three different departments. Her husband was given a criminal trespass, then broke in and the deputy handling things from my house pushed me to go for a restraining order which the judge denied because he hasn't done anything to me. I'm currently a few hours from home, but I am so tired and mad and terrified. I went through this crap with my own ex. I don't think I can mentally handle going through it again, and I've lost the one safe place I had. My dad's house is no longer safe for me because this man has targeted me. Not even my friend saw this coming from her husband. So Colin, let's not meet ever again. I started my new job at Will Rogers Airport. I say new job but I was really just moved to a different airline and working in the same ramp agent position. Now, I have to tell you that I have a crippling fear of heights and my least favorite part of being a ramp agent is when I have to climb in the cargo bin on a rear loading plane because it's about 20 feet above the ground. This particular night was a strange mix of a few factors creating an uneasy feeling. The first ambient setting condition is it was raining not just light raining but pouring rain with a few scattered lightning flashes and random power surges. Every now and then we have dead bodies transported in the cargo bins, this was one of those occasions and tonight was my lucky night apparently because my manager told me I was throwing this plane. Throwing meaning I was pulling the cargo out of the bin. It was the last plane for the night and there wasn't very much cargo beside the body. My coworker John pulled the ramp loader to the plane and raised it up so I could walk up the conveyor belt to enter the bin. About four other co-workers come over with a baggage tug for the cargo, I say to everyone in a louder than normal tone because the rain was loudly smacking the metal shell of the airplane, I hope y'all are ready, I'm not trying to be in there all night, John laughed and said, don't worry about it, maybe you can make a new friend in there, in reference to the body, I didn't think it was funny but I chuckled and told him to, shut up, and, let's get going. I climbed into the small and cramped space and sat in the bin as far from this human-sized white cardboard box as I could and pulled my phone out of my pocket to select a playlist to listen to while I threw the bin. I find a good one and I start working, the conveyor belt moves at a snail's pace and you have to wait until they skin each individual package so I can't just throw them as fast as I want to get out of there. About 10 minutes into it I'm getting closer and closer to this box and my music stops playing. I've had earbuds that short out when they get wet so in the front of my mind I automatically assumed that rain somehow got on and I just needed to shake a little water out of them, but they were bone dry. I check Spotify to see if it was a glitch or problem with the app and I see I have an unread text. Did I get a notification and forgot in the midst of my rap fueled baggage handling? The way my phone is set up, when I get a message it will tell you who it is from but it won't display the message, you have to access them to read it. The message was from an unknown number which was odd because very few people have my number to begin with. I clicked the notification to read the message and all it said was, I. I sent a text back saying, uh, hey, who is this? My phone displayed that whoever sent the message saw mine immediately after it was sent. I waited and no response. I started my playlist back up and got back to my job. Shortly after a crash of thunder that was so loud the plane shook made me jump at first but I quickly rationalized it and returned to work. I noticed the conveyor belt was no longer moving. I yelled to John, what the hell is going on out there? Why did it stop? John replied, damn thing ran out of gas. We're going to take this load of cargo to drop off while we get another loader over here. Sit tight, I think to myself, where TF else am I going to go? About one minute later it got cold, like I could see my breath cold. I wrote it off as just a cold front and reach over for some stranger's luggage to lean on while I wait. As I look over for a bag to grab lighting went across the sky and I saw a quick flash of a little boy 11 maybe 12 years old sitting on the white box, staring at me with this eerily happy smile and his head turned slightly to the side, my heart sunk and I froze, never taking my eyes off that box for what felt like hours. I was startled by the replacement conveyor belt starting up right next to the plane. I darted to the moving conveyor crawling as fast as I could trying to keep my balance and panic at the same time. I hit the ground and looked at John and said, nope, I'm done, you're going to have to go in there, I didn't want to explain exactly what I saw but John knew something scared me shitless, he asked me, what's wrong, 
who was it? I stuttered and walked away before I could say anything. Then I got a new text message notification that I heard loud and clear this time, a response from the unknown sender saying, It's your new friend. This isn't really something out of the ordinary. Most of us had times when we were little kids in which we thought we saw a monster, heard voices, or just got the feeling of something, or someone, watching us. Mine is one of those stories. I'm not a believer in the paranormal, UFOs, ghosts, or anything like that. This was just something that happened, and it still gives me chills to this day. I grew up in Sherwood Park, Alberta, Canada. I live in Minnesota now, but that's beside the point. I was about seven or eight years old, I can't remember. Our house was a four-bedroom, three-bathroom home with my room being in the downstairs basement along with the playroom. As you entered the playroom you would see our fort, which my dad had built for my brother, sister, and I. It had two levels, top and bottom, with the bottom being the most, for lack of a better word, and used. The bottom half had a small window-like opening along with an entrance just below the slide. Yeah, we had a slide. The entire thing took up, perhaps, a third of the whole playroom. It was a pretty big fort and we absolutely loved playing in it, letting our imaginations take us wherever we wanted. Anywhere from flying in a plane through the wild blue of the open sky, on a spaceship, voyaging through the black and wondrous void of space, to the open ocean on a rogue pirate ship. When our imaginations were put on pause for the day and I would walk over to my room and turn in for the night, I saw the fort in a completely different light. Or, maybe lack of light would be more accurate. No longer was it the vessel for imaginary play, but it became a den for the dark, obscure, and macabre. One night in particular, all the lights were turned off, so my kid-like imagination would do whatever it could to keep the immersion from our day-long play going. I looked over to the bottom half of the fort, and could have sworn that I heard, breathing. Not like the normal breathing that you hear from any Joe Schmo passerby, but a heavy and breathy sound. It sounded, angry, angry and eager. The breath seemed to get louder the longer I stood there. The devilish inhales and exhales consumed my attention, eating at my ears, clawing, and burrowing into my consciousness. For a moment, I was paralyzed and I could have sworn that I heard guttural sounds coming from the already terrifying breaths. It drew in and out, in and out, in and out. Suddenly my mind snapped me out of my paralysis and I ran to my room, turning on the light and shutting the door with reckless and frightened abandon. I took a moment to compose myself and contemplate, in my little childlike brain, what just happened. I was scared, terrified. However, my imagination quickly gave way to my rational thoughts. There was no way something was down there. No way, not at all. It may have been my dad, conducting one of his outrageously silly pranks to scare us kids. If so, he certainly got me, and he got me good. My mind settled and I was able to slip into pajamas and switch the television on before I went to sleep. You know, something to distract me from what I thought I just heard. However, when I was outside my room, the moment that I turned around and ran into my room, out of my peripheral vision, I thought I saw two crimson eyes in the fort window. Two eyes that showed predatory anger, malicious intent, and hunger. I recently took my first ever trip out of the country and went to Peru. The travel advisory for the area warns of possible terrorism slash crime. During the trip several Peruvians told me it wasn't safe for women to walk alone, that it wasn't safe to use a cell phone in a car with an open window because it could be snatched, that saying no to a robber could get us killed, etc. The friend who invited me and myself spoke decent enough Spanish to get by but someone speaking rapidly or switching from basic English to rapid Spanish like the man in this story was difficult to understand. We got off the plane in Lima at around 1 a.m. and headed outside to find our Uber. My friend and I are very different people. She acts like she has real life plot armor. I have PTSD and am hypervigilant slash extremely cautious. When we stepped outside a man started shouting at us in Spanish and aggressively gesturing to walk away from where we were standing. I don't know what she thought but I thought maybe we were standing in the wrong area and he worked with the airport. I quickly changed my mind as he had nothing to suggest that and started snapping taxi at us when he heard us speak English. My friend explained in English and Spanish that we were waiting for our Uber driver Berto and the man frowned. He walked away, my friend stopped paying attention, but I noticed he went to a group of men for a huddle. I could make out aggressive snatches of Uber. Uber. Berto. 
one of the men broke away dressed in a sort of a suit and rapidly approached. For this conversation and the rest of our interaction he spoke snatches of English mixed with rapid Spanish. He basically started ushering us to the parking area and offered to take my friend's bag. I started objecting and she mentioned we were waiting for our Uber and he insisted that it wasn't possible for Uber to come to the airport, he had to take us outside. For some reason my friend rolled with that and let him take her bag and lock it in the trunk. I kept pointing out that it didn't make sense and we shouldn't get in with him, but she went for it and I wasn't about to be alone in a foreign airport parking lot at 1am with no phone signal. Me being me, I took down his license plate before I got into the car and recorded much of the conversation. He kept the pretense of taking us to the driver and then started intimating he knew our driver, eventually calling him by name, and my friend forgot she told them earlier and bought that. But then he basically said he was taking us for the Uber, instead of Berto, and to TLDR the finer points of the broken conversation he said he knew the address of our hostel then insisted we tell him what it was. Asked for a fare of 40 sols, roughly 10 US dollars, and said he took the card. Then started saying he was with the airport and a taxi company. He kept repeating he was with the airport and flashed a paper at us, and said his name was Angel. Angel proceeded to tell us how dangerous Lima was and we shouldn't be going there, we would be robbed, assaulted, etc. And he was especially aghast at what he called lady boys. Then Angel started insisting he be paid 50 US dollars in cash, which I protested and said was different from what he claimed. My friend for some reason decided otherwise and after explaining she didn't have cash he zipped us to an ATM and demanded she get the money. It was past 1 a.m., dark, in an area that looked like a movie set for a high crime area, I had no signal and she barely had any. No one knew where we were or who we were with, and we didn't know if he was armed. I didn't want to get back into the car but her suitcase was still in the trunk and we didn't have another ride. I'd heard stories about tourists in foreign countries being scammed in a similar way, and being met with violence if they said no, or even if they agreed. My panic was sky high. But she got the money and he proceeded to drive us to our hostel, continuing his tirade about the dangers. We passed a young man on a stairwell who appeared to be wearing makeup and the driver pointed and said something like, see, lady boy, not safe. That was the only nearly comical part of the situation. He seemed very agitated about a man wearing makeup, whereas I was very concerned about being robbed slash murdered. He pulled up to what he claimed was our hostel and it looked deserted. Angel told us to just knock and my friend asked if he'd wait to make sure we got in safe. He said okay and we headed to the door only to find it was locked, dark, and not our hostel. Angel had already gotten back into his car and zipped away. So we were on the side of a dark street, having been clearly scammed, in an area he emphasized was extremely dangerous for us, with no signal and no way to ask for help. Our hostel ended up being nearby though and we were able to walk to it slash enter without any more issues. To the man who pretended to be our Uber driver, told us we were in danger repeatedly, demanded more money after taking us away from the airport, then ditched us at a random building in the wee hours of the morning, let's not meet again unless it involves your sketchy arse going to prison. A couple of years ago, I flew home to visit my family. I'd be there about a week, then we'd head to the coast for a week, then back home for another week. I totally needed this break. I just ended an on again slash off again relationship, like, seriously, one day on, the next off. It took seven months of putting up with it, because you're supposed to fight for what is important to you, right? Anyhow, I finally just said it was done, no more chances, no trying to work it out, just done. So, with that chapter of my life being over, I was more than happy to be somewhere else, surrounded by family, and begin putting myself back together. Got there, spent a couple of days sleeping a lot. My mother's a nurse and she was becoming concerned that there was something physically wrong with me. I just needed a couple days in a safe place where I could let my brain work on digesting the new life I would have when I got back home. So, before we left for the coast, I met up with a friend from grade school that I kept in contact with over the years. I thought it would just be him and I, but it didn't really faze me that another person was there. We hung out for a while and then I needed to head home because I had to take a backwards rural route to get home or taking a different route that would add another 20 miles onto my track. Being backwards, I needed to be able to keep an eye out for deer. So, I said goodbye and told S.A. that if he was ever in my neck of the woods, look me up and we'd grab a drink and hang out. I told him to grab my number from my friend and out the door I went. About halfway home, I got this weird queasy feeling in the pit of my stomach, so I slowed way down and sure enough, 
there was a deer in the middle of the road. Because I had slowed down, I could see another car out on the road. I couldn't shake the queasy feeling, so I figured it would be better to cut off and go down to the main road because there were more places to stop. I seriously didn't want to stop in some rural farmer's driveway. I've watched too many movies to make that mistake. So, I get over to the main road and pull into a gas station and sit there for a couple minutes trying not to get sick to my stomach. I ran into the store, grabbed some water and ginger ale, and came back out to my vehicle, still unable to shake that queasy feeling. So, I started to head home from the gas station and knew I didn't want to go straight home, so I drove around, taking this road or that road, until that weird feeling started to go away. Then, I went home, read for a bit, and then went to sleep. Next day, everything was fine and we headed off to the coast. Fast forward two weeks. Trip is over. I'm still feeling a little bit fragile over the breakup, but that's all. I figured I would begin the process of cleansing the environment of negative energies and then work through the baggage that came from the breakup. I knew there was a lot and it would take time. So, the next day, I'm going about my business and everything is cool as can be when picking through the junk left behind after a breakup. I'm really just doing mindless things to zone out and not have to think too much about the activity, since my brain was working full time already. A little bit later in the day, my phone rings. I don't get a lot of calls, so I assumed that there might be a family emergency and that I needed to answer it ASAP. The area code of the caller, who is not in my contacts, is the same as my cousin, so I answered without a second thought. On the other end was S.A., the acquaintance I met at my friend's house. It's a little weird to have him calling me, but I'm not thinking that anything is terribly out of the ordinary. I asked him what was up and he said he was at the airport. I still find it a little odd, but I said, oh, that's cool. Where are you going? He said that he'd already landed. Again, I'm distracted and really just want to get him off the phone so I could go back to my mental sidestep and zone out while my brain chugged away. So, I said that I hoped he had a good time wherever he was. He said that he needed me to pick him up. Screech? What? Did you just say you needed me to pick you up? Yeah, he replied. I came to visit you. Pause there for a second. I know for a fact that I didn't show any more interest in him than general courtesy. Even the tossed over the shoulder look me up comment was one of those polite things to say because you never actually plan on seeing them again. On pause. Why did you come to visit me? I asked. He said he felt a deep connection and wanted to be with me. I'm starting to get angry as well as freaked out at this stage. I told him I didn't feel a connection at all and couldn't believe that he would fly across the country to see someone that he'd spent maybe two hours with. He said that I invited him when I said to look him up. I said, erm, um, no. That's just a polite thing to say to some random person that has made a very small impression on me. He said that he needed to find a way back home then since I misled him. Misled him? WTF? Look me up if you're ever in my neck of the woods had led him to think that was a basis for any sort of encounter that was meaningful. He said that he needed a place to stay until he could get the money for a plane ticket back. I said there were more than enough hotels that he could stay at while he got himself sorted out. He said he didn't have any money after buying the random one-way plane ticket. So, at this stage, I'm flabbergasted, angry, and freaked out that someone would do that on a one-way ticket. I finally caved and said he could stay the night while he sorted shit out, but I expected him to be gone no later than the morning of the day after tomorrow. So, I bring him back to my place throw pillows and a blanket on the couch and turn to head to my bedroom and he asks if he can sleep with me. I'm like, uh, no. Actually no fucking way is that going to happen. So, I point out that I have firearms and do not attempt to come in. Next day, I had to work, so I woke him up and told him to get up and find a way home immediately. I also told him that I had to work, but would check in on his progress because the next morning, I was dropping him off at departures regardless of whether he had a way back or not. Went to work, he blew up my phone all day. Wanted me to come back to my place for lunch. Told him no, I'm way too busy. I finally get home from work and I'm chuckling at a text that I got about my dog. And, that's when I noticed that he rearranged everything, and by everything, I mean every room of the house has been rearranged. I flipped my lid. I asked him why he thought it was normal to do anything that he did. Instead of answering, he asked me who I'd been talking to. I said that it really wasn't any of his business but I had received a text from the guy watching my dog while I was on vacation. Color me shocked when he says that he doesn't want me to talk to that guy. No longer freaked. 
full-force apocalyptic disaster is about to be unleashed and leave nothing but a smoking crater. The temperature drops about 10 degrees, and I very calmly said to get his shit and I was calling a cab to take him to the airport because he's fucking psycho. Side note, full rage has been achieved when it feels like the temperature drops and I speak very calmly. If I'm complaining about something, it's a quick burn. If I go monotone calm and tilt my head to one side slightly, that is where I hit arctic level anger. So he, unaware of the environmental change that has occurred and that the chances of survival are dropping by the second, decides to tell me that he used my computer and got my ex's phone number and they both agree that I was just heartless. We're fast approaching the epic scale disaster and he finally seems to notice how deep into rage I had sunk. I told him it was unlikely that he had gotten into my computer because it's a full quote of a part of the art of war by Sun Tzu and that he would have to have been the processing power of the Hadron Collider computers and it was obvious that was not the case. I told him he had three minutes to get his stuff and get out or I wouldn't be responsible for what would occur. So, still yelling insults at me, he gathers his stuff and leaves. I used to get calls and texts from him. I'd block one, and six more would pop up, but it eventually stopped. To this day I have no idea, nor interest in knowing where he's at or if he made it back. So, crazy dude who would hop on a plane with a one-way ticket based on a random polite comment, let's not meet, again. I was watching the Jeffrey Epstein doc on Netflix last night and I'm spooked. Literally had a mini panic attack with all these memories flooding in. As I'm laying in bed watching, a girl's face flashes across the screen and I recognize one of his victims as one of my really good childhood friends. I've lived in South Florida almost all my life with my crazy controlling parents that wouldn't let me do anything as a kid. No phone calls to friends, no extracurricular activities unless it was academic couldn't have friends over and you can forget about me going over to anyone's house. Plus, my dad worked at my school during my elementary school years so I had to be on my best behavior. So, when I went to middle school, I was so fucking pumped. Finally some type of freedom, my personality started to shine and making friends came easy to me. Fast forward to a year in and I had become really good friends with these two girls, we can call them Heather and Sharon, they were both pretty, popular friendly but what fascinated me most was that Heather was the only girl in middle school that I knew that was able to sleep over a boy's house. It was something so foreign to me since my parents told me I couldn't even go on a date with a boy until after I graduated, high school or college, they didn't specify. So I automatically thought she was the coolest chick I've ever met. Throughout our friendship, we were known as the tripod. We had all the same classes and lunch periods so we all got pretty close. Over time, Heather would always ask me to hang out with her and Sharon either after school or on the weekends, but with my parents, there was no way in hell. I did attempt multiple times to ask for permission with no success each time, not even a maybe. I was so bummed because I always felt left out having Heather and Sharon hang out without me, something I would eventually become grateful for. One day while sitting out in the courtyard for lunch, Heather pulled me aside and asked what I thought about skipping school for one day. I instantly freaked out and thought about that automated message the school calls home with to let you parents know you weren't at school. If my parents ever got that, my ass would be toast. So I shut that idea down right away, kinda laughed it off because there would be no way to pull it off. But she literally would not stop asking, so eventually she convinced me and we were ready to start the planning. It took us about a week every day, during lunch trying to figure out how to pull this off. The thrill of it had me so excited as I've never done anything like this. The plan was to have my mom drop me off at school as usual and have the girls there waiting for me and we would simply just walk off to the gas station that's near the school and have one of Heather's friends pick us up, not sure how I planned on dodging the school call but whatever. Oh and I forgot to add, Heather made it a point several times to remind me that I need to wear something that would give me an innocent look. I blew this off because I was already 13 years old, I looked innocent enough. Plan goes smoothly and we are walking to the gas station, but as we're walking, Heather's cell phone is blowing up. Like constant phone calls and texts coming through, each one she answers, just meet us at the gas station like we usually do. At this point, I'm confused because I thought it was supposed to be the tripod hanging out for the day. As we get closer to the gas station, I see a group of like 7 other girls standing there and they're around my same age range, 12 to 14 years old, some girls I've seen around school, others I don't recognize but they all perk up when they see Heather walk up. 
All of a sudden Heather yells, who's ready to make some money, and almost all the girls raise their hands and start cheering. I grabbed Sharon and asked her what she's talking about, and the look that Sharon gave me is one I'll never forget. It was like she was saying, get out now while you can. It just made me very uncomfortable and she never ended up saying anything. It was just weird, a big group of young girls who should be in school just hanging at a gas station. As we're standing there, two black Lincoln Town cars pull up and make a sudden stop right in front of us. Heather starts numbering the girls and tells the first group to get in the first car, and as they do, the car speeds away. The other one slowly rolls the window down, and I see this older man with sunglasses on just sitting there smiling. He asks if we're ready to go to the mansion, which excites the two other girls standing behind me. He opens the door and they both jump in, followed by Sharon. Heather is standing next to me and nudges me to go on, but as she does, I start going off on her, asking her what the hell is going on, where are we going, who is this man and why didn't she mention this in any of her plans. She's looking almost annoyed at me and says, out of all the girls I bring, you're the only one that's giving me a problem. I thought you would want to get out and finally have some fun. And with your body, you could make a killing. At the time, I was so naive I didn't know exactly what she meant but by the tone of her voice and how pressured she was making me feel. I ended up backing out and ran back to school. As embarrassed as I felt for bailing on my friends, I feared my mom and her belt a lot more plus, going off in a car with someone I've never met screamed stranger danger. I'm so grateful that my parents put that fear in me or else I don't know if I would have made that smart decision. After that, I barely hung out with Heather again. She tried a few more times but I just got bad vibes from her and cut her off but I always saw her randomly walk out of school toward the gas station, always with a group of girls. Sharon on the other hand, she started to spiral into depression slowly. She would only hang out with Heather and would cling to her like a lost puppy. I noticed she would miss school more frequently, until one day she just stopped coming altogether. Years later I found out she committed suicide and recently, after watching the doc, I'm convinced she was one of Jeffrey Epstein's victims and Heather was one of his recruiters. Should have mentioned this happened in 2004 in West Palm Beach. I reached out to the only childhood friend I stay in contact with and she confirmed that it was in fact my friend whom we went to middle school with in that documentary. Since this morning, I've contacted a friend who's in law enforcement to see if I could speak with someone about what I know. Even the little information I have could help out in some way. As for Sharon, I never met anyone in her family or had any contact information as I was on major lockdown back then and this was 16 years ago. Still trying to track them down to see if they knew about any of this. It could help explain why she might have taken her life. I'll keep you updated. I'm a 23-year-old guy here. I live in a pretty safe neighborhood and, usually, always lock my doors. Last night, I apparently didn't. It was not too long after I had taken my dogs out for the last time and was turning off the TV and lights when one of my dogs started growling. Not too weird since he sometimes does that when people walk by the house. He only does it to certain people not everyone. I then heard the front door open and someone walk in. My dog then started barking. My other dog, who loves all people, came running from the other room to greet our guest. At the same time I was reacting to what was happening and went, what the fuck? Who are you? Standing in the hall was a guy in his mid to late twenties. He was skinny and tall. Um, oh wait, I don't think I'm in the right place. He genuinely seemed confused. I replied with, hell no you aren't. Please get out. He apologized and said he was coming to hang out with a friend and just accidentally went to the wrong place. I asked him what house he was looking for and he said a number that was just a few couple numbers off from mine. He apologized again and left. He seemed nice and non-threatening but I was still kind of spooked. This morning I was ready to laugh the whole thing off. I was planning on telling my neighbor, a couple in their thirties, what happened. I don't know them all too well but we have talked before. Luckily, I caught one of them when I was taking my dogs out. I didn't want to come off like I was mad or scared over what happened so I casually said, I'm sure he told you about it but your friend paid me a surprise visit last night. My neighbor gave me this confused look and said, what are you talking about? Your friend. He walked into my house last night thinking it was your place. My neighbor was quiet for a second and then said, I don't want to alarm you. But I have no idea what you're talking about. We didn't have a friend over last night. In 2010, I was driving from New Orleans, Louisiana to Eugene, Oregon. It was just me, a 24-year-old female and my two-year-old pit bull in a 14-foot U-Haul truck with everything I owned crammed into the back, fancy, flip phone, and my print out of MapQuest directions. 
I think the first smartphones actually came out around that time, but I didn't have one. Cell phone service was also much spottier and there were long stretches through the desert where I had zero service for hundreds of miles. I was driving a lonely stretch of highway through central Texas when I realized I hadn't seen a town or exit for a very long time and my giant U-Haul was really low on gas. Just when I'm starting to freak out and seriously run out of gas, I see a small town coming up. I pull into this town and it is tiny. I was so worried about other things that I never did pay attention to the name of the town, but there were only about six streets in the whole place. I gas up and am ready to get back on the road. Except I cannot for the life of me find my way back to the highway. I circle the town about four times and start getting so frustrated because this is such a tiny town, how can I not find my way out? I can literally see the highway but can't get to it. I return to the gas station to ask for directions. Now when I got gas, I paid at the pump and never went in. When I enter for directions there's a skinny, nondescript guy who has black hair hanging down in front of his eyes that looks like it could use a good wash. He's not particularly creepy, but a little rude. He never really met my eyes, he was looking down at a magazine. He gives me directions that don't sound right at all. He's telling me to take a road that will get me to the highway in about 17 miles. For a moment I am dumbfounded. Then I point out that I didn't drive that far to get from the highway into town, why so far to get back to the highway? I can literally see it from the town. He is so casual, almost like I'm just an annoyance and can follow his directions or not, why should he care? He gives me some explanation about the road curving around that doesn't really make sense. He still doesn't look at me. Just whatever, I gave you your directions and waved his hand in the direction of the door. When I got into the parking lot my whole body started trembling violently and my heart started racing, seemingly for no reason. I got into the truck and as soon as I put the key into the ignition I burst into tears. I had the most terrible feeling that, no matter how nonchalant he acted, this man had bad intentions. I didn't know what but I knew right then and there that there was no way I was going to follow his directions. Yet this was the only store in this little town and, short of knocking on doors, no thank you, there was no one else to ask for directions. I decided I didn't give a shit if this town seemed like something dropped out of the twilight zone. I was going to drive around until I found my own way out, even if it took all damn night. Then a big red beater of a pickup truck, as much rust as metal, pulls up and disgorges the quintessential Texan man, huge, husky and in flannel and work boots. Without even thinking about it, I jumped out of the truck and approached him quickly yet warily. Looking into his eyes, I saw a kind human being, or at least I was hoping I did. I asked him if he could please give me directions to the highway. I told him I knew it was silly, but I just couldn't seem to find my way back. He looked concerned as I was visibly upset, so he made me laugh and very cheerfully gave me directions for a hairpin curve turn off right at the end of a small concrete tunnel I had passed several times. He said it often confused travelers because it was so hard to see, they needed to put up signs, etc. With a sinking feeling in my stomach, I asked him how far in miles was it back to the highway. He laughed and gave me a funny look. Miles, miss. I'd say it's a quarter mile at most, you can see the highway right from here. At this point I couldn't help it, I had to know. What happens if I drive and I gave him the directions the man in the store had given me? Texas looked at me very intently and asked me how I knew about that route. It was pretty far out and usually only locals know about it. So I told him. He was quiet for a few minutes and then asked what the attendant looked like and if I had a map of the state. Nope, just my map quest, which wasn't helpful in this situation. He goes to his truck and grabs a raggedy local map from his glove box. Spreading it out for me, he traces the route I describe. The way the man from the gas station had told me to go led away from town, away from the interstate, and led to seemingly the middle of nowhere. Texas told me that the road did go about 17 miles, right before it dead ended in the desert. I asked him what was out there, and he told me that it was nothing but some junk cars and a few trailers and mobile homes, all owned by the same family. This family was known locally as troublemakers, meth heads, and alcoholics, and these were the nice things townspeople had to say about them. And the erstwhile clerk was part of this family and lived down that road. I'll never forget the look in Texas's eyes as he told me this. He also told me that I was smart to listen to my instincts and he told me to be careful traveling out there. I don't know if the man from the gas station wanted what was in the back of my U-Haul or what was in the driver's seat, but thankfully I didn't have to find out. Oh, and I learned that sometimes angels look like ruddy-haired Texans with scruffy faces and rusty pickups. Thank you, random Texan stranger. You really saved my ass and I will always remember you with tons of love.
Sorry I didn't ask your name, you're forever Texas to me now. So my stepsons are 7 and 10. They play with 5 other boys in our area which are of similar age and all go to the same school in our neighborhood. Now there is a police station in our neighborhood and we live in a city that is large but we feel very safe here and have almost zero crime around us so when they want to go to the park slash play with friends, my husband and I agreed it's okay. They will be gone for hours going from house to house swimming, jumping on trampoline, scootering, skateboarding, sometimes they are all at my house in my pool. It's a good system. I'm texting with other parents etc so we have a pretty safe system. However, our state has been known for human trafficking because we are close enough to the border. It's just something I worry about. So I bought them bright orange rape whistles and tied them to their backpacks, sometimes they all ride bikes to the school together. At home I had them each blow into the whistle as hard as they could so they knew how loud it was and to only use it for emergencies, which we discussed in emergency situations. Today, on break from school the kids wanted to do a lemonade stand something in my gut told me to say no that's not a good idea even though they had their own little garage sale around Christmas to make money to buy gifts and the neighborhood thought it was so cute they actually got a ton of donations and made very good money. I didn't have any worries that time. Today was different for me though. As my older stepson was making his signs I reminded him about interacting with strangers and he needed to watch his brother and so he asked me, should I bring my whistle? I said yes. Great idea. I took it off his backpack and put it around his neck and I told him I'm going to leave the window open. If you feel scared or if something happens you blow that whistle like there is no tomorrow and I'll run outside. They were right on our street corner of our neighborhood, right where the main street through our neighborhood is so a decent amount of cars go by. An hour or so goes by and I'm into a documentary when I hear that fucking whistle and my stomach drops and I dash outside to see a flashy red car. Like a charger I believe I was looking slash running towards the kids and so I wasn't paying close enough attention to the car but I immediately see all kids are accounted for as guys getting back into his car and my older son tells me our younger son, who really likes cars as does his dad, he goes to car shows and knows so much about cars husband has a GTR from Japan and another racing type car they work on together, that the man in the car got out and was talking to them asking them their ages and invited my younger son to get into his car. I literally told my older son earlier, do not get into or near anyone's cars. So he said he didn't feel safe anymore and blew that whistle as hard as he could. My son said the car was what's known as a demon, which I believe is a Dodge Charger, red. That's what my son told the police. I got a good look at the guy at least but didn't get the plates. He was getting into his car as I was making sure the kids were accounted for and pounded the fuck out of his hood asking him why would you ever invite a child into your car. Before he drove away. I wasn't thinking clearly and was in a bit of a panic. So I didn't get the plates, I was right there. I'm so pissed at myself for that. But the kids were all talking and I just went into protective mode and called the police. The police said they searched our entire neighborhood for the car and put out a description of the guy in car, with a now a possibly dented hood from me. And they put out an alert and are taking this very seriously, so at least there's that. I'm so thankful for that $10 whistle I ordered on Amazon. Sometimes you just know when shit is about to go down. Still so shaken up about it and all of the kids and parents are super concerned. We have a community website and we posted about our encounter on the website for other parents to be aware as well. I don't know for certain that the guy was up to no good but if he wasn't why leave so suddenly you know. I don't know. My view on safety has been wrecked and it's going to take a while for things to feel okay again I think. Make sure your kids have a plan for emergencies. They have intuitions also and there's just something about that gut feeling you shouldn't ignore. It amazes me sometimes. Hi guys. This is a real story that has absolutely traumatized me and my boyfriend. Two years ago, I moved to the UK for university, as I always wanted to go there and get away from my parents as the situation at home was beginning to become too toxic for me. In my first year at uni, I moved into student accommodation and met some really great people. It was a good year, without meeting my boyfriend, who I'm still with and just enjoying my time away from my family and discovering what independence really meant. Anyhow, a second year came by, I decided with some friends to move into a house rented by student accommodations, 
but at least we had our own house and weren't restricted as much with noise and parties as living in a small shared flat like in first year. Note, I had a ground floor room, and my window gave into a very small backyard, in which I would go smoke every day as I am a smoker, and in which there would be a very thin wooden door giving into the other side of the street, where you would put your bins and broken chairs and more babble. The door could only be closed and locked from inside the backyard, but since it was an old door we had to attach some strings to keep it closed for good. I had neighbors on each side of the house, so we were surrounded by families and some other student accommodations. The neighbors on the right of us were five boys, who looked way over the age of being in university. They were strange so to say. I met one of them outside of our house one day because of a police intervention due to one of his flatmates attacking him and the others with the kitchen knife and burning their kitchen down. I heard some screams and so I went outside with my flatmates and saw one of them being covered in blood and cuts everywhere on his arm and a wound on his head inflicted by a kitchen knife. Me and my flatmates didn't know what to do so we offered him our help to clean himself and gave him an old t-shirt to change out of his bloody clothes. We then saw the guy who hurt these flatmates being escorted out by the police and into a van and driven off to be arrested. I don't know anything more about the story, the police didn't really tell us anything else. Anyway, the guy who we helped was quite weird. He said a lot of BS and kept trying to grab me and flirting with me, and we noticed when helping him he smoked quite a lot of marijuana, but just didn't really care at the moment, as we just wanted to make sure he was okay as we didn't know him. Then after some time had passed, I would go to uni and come back home and see him quite often in the street, and just never said a word to him again. But one day, he came up to me in the street while I went to the corner shop and started talking to me weirdly and I didn't feel comfortable at all with that for some reason so I just didn't respond to him. He then just said, oh that's okay, I'll just wait in front of your house then, and we can talk further. No need to say, I was creeped out, and just thought he was joking, so I bought my drink at the shop and headed back to my street, and as I turned into the street where my house was, I saw him with his flatmate sitting on my doorstep and waiting for me. So I panicked and went back next to the corner shop and called my only guy flatmate to ask him to open the door and tell the guys to go away, but obviously he wasn't home and no one else was either. So I literally just waited it out, until they left one hour later, and then sprinted back home and locked the front door. Note, my front door had a glass panel on it where you would be able to kind of make out who was standing in front of it. After this already pretty scary encounter, I just tried to avoid the guy, and mostly succeeded for a while. But then one day, as I went smoking in the backyard, I noticed that the wooden door, which is always closed, was open, and the strings that we put there to keep it closed were cut off. For whatever reason, I didn't think anything of it, and just closed the door again and put a new string on it, thinking it was one of my flatmates who took the bends out and just didn't tie it back. The weird neighbors would very often scream and yell and fight in their house, and it would wake me and my flatmates up in the middle of the night, but we kinda got used to it after a while. But one evening, my boyfriend slept over like he usually did, and he, who usually never ever wakes up because of a noise, woke up in the middle of the night because of a bang and some whispering. I was sound asleep so he very silently woke me up, and we both just waited in the dark and listened for any other noises. Suddenly we heard the wooden door just bang, just shot open and some footsteps next to my window. I always had my window open because it would get really warm inside, so we both just froze. And then we heard the door leading to the backyard get shaken softly as if they were trying to get inside, and then they stopped. Luckily we had the curtains closed, so they couldn't see us but we were ready to get dressed and get the F out of the room and lock them in if they came in from the window. Then we just heard my window move and get more open, and one of the guys said something in a different language that we didn't understand and started to hear them trying to get in. My boyfriend and I just shot up out of the bed, took my phone, and put clothes on and ran out of the room and out of the house, so I then called my flatmates and told them to lock themselves in their rooms and then the police, who luckily came in less than five minutes as the headquarters were a couple of streets down from us. I don't remember anything after the police came, I think me and my boyfriend were in shock. They ended up catching one guy, the other fled and was later found a few streets up smoking weed. The police told us they went inside of their house and found a lot of meth and heroin, and that they were just carrying a massive kitchen knife with them. I was so confused as I've never done anything to offend or do anything wrong to my neighbors, so the idea of them breaking in with God knows what intentions with the kitchen knife terrorized me and my boyfriend. The two guys ended up being arrested and one of them was put in prison for two years for carrying a weapon with intention to harm. I never heard anything else from the police, and I moved back home a few months later, as I was so scared and it tormented me for months on end not knowing what would have happened if my boyfriend didn't wake up. I'm now still coping with it, 
and finding it really tough to get over it, of always asking myself, what if, and what would have happened if. I now very often wake up because of the slightest noise and get horrible nightmares because of it, but hey, at least I'm still with my boyfriend and we often talk about it and it helps a lot. Last year, I was staying in a university hall for my final year. It's a private building so not connected to the university, and out in the city near the main town. We have a car park but nobody really uses it because we are poor students and it costs money to park there so mine was one of only two or three cars at any given time. The car park isn't well lit and it's to the side of the building, so you have to walk for about two or three minutes to get into the main door. I was sitting in my car one evening after getting back from the gym, just scrolling on my phone because my seat was warm and it was dark and raining outside so I couldn't be bothered to get up yet. I was reading an article when suddenly someone started knocking on my window, which was really odd. It was a man dressed all in black, and he started telling me how his friend had seen me through the window and thought I was really attractive, so could he have my number? I responded no, that's a bit odd and I don't feel comfortable with it. He continued to be insistent for a while, practically begging me to get out and give them my number or my social media details, telling me I should come over and speak to his friend, who was, weirdly, stood at the other side of the car park, furthest away from the building. I kept saying no, and scrolling on my phone to show that I wasn't interested. He finally relented and walked away. I text one of my friends to ask if he'd come and get me and walk with me to the building. As I was waiting, this man returned but now with this hood up, he started banging loudly on my window, saying that I was being rude, ungrateful, and calling me all kinds of names. I kept staring at my phone and pretended I couldn't hear him. He then started trying my door handle, thankfully I'd locked my car after the first encounter, and then began violently pushing into my car when it didn't work. I still kept ignoring him and texted my friend to probably bring some other friends with him. My friend was taking a long time to read my message, and I was terrified but for some reason didn't think to call the police, probably because I was scared of things escalating. The guy at my window had calmed down after a few minutes and walked off, saying that he'd leave me alone now. However, I watched him out of the corner of my eye join up with his friend and then maybe three or four other men. They walked so that they were out of sight but I could see their shadows lingering as they kind of circled around my car and moved towards the building but staying in the dark. They lingered there for a while, until luckily another car came which was obviously full of students going to a party due to the loud music and singing going on inside. This group of men left as they saw these people arrive, and I latched onto them and was able to walk with them as they entered the building. When I got home, my friend finally responded. He said that he'd actually heard about these guys before. Apparently they'd followed another girl into the building and into the lift a couple of days prior, then stood in the lift making really gross sexual comments to her. She'd had to run to her door and lock it, where they'd then stand outside knocking on the door and whispering for her to open it. We were able to report this to the building, who, to their credit, then hired a permanent set of security staff. We also got the CCTV footage of both incidents and were able to pass this on to police. So weird men harassing young women at my university building. Let's not meet. Hello. Just joined this Reddit because I finally want to tell people about this story. It's not the scariest it gets, but it freaked me up quite a bit. Features, stalking, recording, threats. Back when I was littler, I used to have a friend, Billy, and his older brother Jack. There was a neighbor up above on a hill down the road from their house, who was normally reclusive. As a friend who just came over every weekend, I wasn't really aware of his existence at first. One night, I heard creaking on their balcony outside while I was sleeping in the living room. The living room had three large windows facing the balcony next to the street, and the door to the left. I was having trouble sleeping since me and my friends had been playing horror games. I looked out the window, and saw the flash of a light from the balcony. I understandably flipped out, and the parents came running and ran out onto the balcony, where they caught a glimpse of a man sprinting away. We stayed up that night eating snacks, just kind of vibing while scared. The next weekend I was there, a man showed up at the door with the camera, recording us without us knowing for a few minutes. The father went out there and started yelling at him as he followed him up the road, and the police were called. I'll admit, the father didn't handle it the best, but hey we were all stressed as hell and it was becoming a lot. The man was identified as Daniel Vincent Kelly. The next weekend, we saw Daniel Vincent Kelly down in the far distance in a large parking lot we could see nearby by a lake, we could see it out the front window. He was riding his bike, shirtless, in circles under a large spotlight, 
sometimes looking up at the house. We were understandably horrified, and the man was clearly mentally ill. He vanished from the spotlight, and for the remainder of the night, we were holed up by the windows with weapons in case he tried to record us or break in. The next weekend, we woke up in the night to a loud noise. We found his bike sitting up against the edge of the house, on the property. We grabbed weapons, and kept an eye out that night, and contacted authorities again. They found Daniel Vincent Kelly, and informed us of a YouTube channel he had. This is the most chilling part to me by far, and the part that gives me extreme anxiety at night almost every time I see a window. The most harrowing videos have been deleted due to legal troubles with being non-consensually filmed. He walks around, and claims that a hole in their screen door, which I can verify never existed, has allowed their dog to escape and attack his dog. He claims that within just a few minutes my friend's mother replaced the screen on the door and is covering it up, which is obviously false. The deleted videos still make me sick to think about, as there were at least 20 videos of him secretly recording us, some from long before my first encounter with him. One that I remember vividly was in broad daylight. He was just laying down behind a hill holding his phone up over it recording us, and calling me and my friend disgusting piglets as we played on the porch. At least 10 of the videos featured me and almost all of them featured my friend. Some of them even had Kelly uttering threats, which was terrifying. Sadly, I wasn't allowed over the following weeks and I don't know how it really ended. I have never seen Kelly again, and don't know if he ever got arrested or simply moved away. I wouldn't exactly like to search through his now inactive channel to find out. This happened a few weeks ago. I work at a petrol station. I have years of experience in a previous one, so getting this job was just a piece of cake I guess. Only this was different, it's lone working, can you imagine 8 hours entirely by yourself, especially doing late shifts. So my shift started early in the afternoon about maybe half an hour into my shift. This guy walked in. I saw him before as he entered the shop the day before and randomly asked me if I had any shopping bags to spare. The guy was giving me some uncomfortable vibes but luckily someone else was working with me that day for a short while so I asked them to deal with that guy, my colleague said we don't have anything to spare you and told him bye. The guy leaves. Anyway back to this very day that guy walks in and I thought, fuck sake what doesn't he want now? Another handout. Of course he just walks up to the desk and just starts chatting to me. He was asking me for some advice about his living situation as he told me he used to be homeless. Since to me it's not really my place to give advice. Plus I just really didn't want to be stuck talking to this guy I just shrugged and told him to just sleep on it and have a think about things. And of course he left, he didn't enter the store to buy anything at all just a chat but thinking back I remembered that he asked me what time I got off and stupidly told him, 11 o'clock tonight. I got on with my shift as usual up until 9.30pm he returns but with another guy who may I say look dodgy, all dressed in black hood up the guy who entered the shop previously pokes his head into the door and asked if I do phone top UPS. We do but something in my gut was telling me, make him leave now. So I lied and told him we do not. So the guy and his dodgy friend hung out outside the store for a bit while I was serving customers. Then until the shop seemed quiet again they both entered the store and what looked like they were looking all around the shop. I noticed the dodgy guy kept his hands in his pockets the whole time and then that thought struck me, shit. I'm getting robbed tonight. So I took some deep breaths and tried to keep calm and just thought of my training I repeated in my head, just comply give them what they want then call police after they leave, but of course from the panic I thought to myself better plan so I stood ready with one hand under the desk hovering over the panic button. I thought to myself the minute they pull a weapon out on me, hit the button, as if it's a silent alarm, and show hands and comply and hope police arrive on time to catch them. Well they just ended up buying a bottle of water as of course I did notice there was someone still outside in their car. I felt a huge sigh of relief thinking they just wanted water. Or they decided not to rob me because there's another person outside. They both leave the store but again hang around outside, right by the door. Then I see the car drive away and I thought to myself, I don't want these guys in the store again. Now I'm completely alone. So I flip the switch that automatically locks the main door. Half an hour passes, I had no customers and still the two guys are still hanging around outside. I called my boss to tell him what's going on and to give him a heads up that at some point I'm going to have to call the police and have them move them along as it's making me very anxious. Then another guy shows up and joins the guys all dressed in black and wearing those COVID masks. He also hands his friends masks too then he makes his way around the back of the store. Then I realized. Shit. The back door. The one I go out from to puff on my vape. I ran to the back door, slammed it shut and locked it. 
at this point I was scared for my life. As these guys stacked around the place it felt like an hour and a half. I hid in the office watching the cameras. I picked up the phone and dialed the non-emergency number for the police. At this point I was really freaking out. But of course I had to listen carefully while a bit on the phone was going through those, press 1 for this, I couldn't focus as the next thing a colleague called me on my mobile to check in on me. I told him what's happening, then I came out of the office to take a peek and of course those guys were right up to the window knocking to grab my attention and yes they saw me with two phones to my ears. Shit they saw me. I said to my colleague on the phone that I came up with an idea. I put the phone I had making a call to the police down and kept my colleague on the phone. I said, listen. I'm going to see what they want. Stay on the phone. I'm going to put you on speaker. Stay quiet. Don't say a word. Just listen. If you hear me say, the till is slow, you hang up and call the police. 999 okay? I mean it s me telling you I'm in danger. So I put him on speaker and hide my phone in my bra. I head to the window. What's up guys? Can I help you? Guy, why is the door locked? Takes a breath. That's because we're in night mode now doors locked but I can serve through the hatch. W, what can I get you? They just look at each other and whisper amongst themselves. Guy, we'll just take, branded tobacco name, and a lighter. Sure one moment. I grab what they ask for and they push a 20 pound note through. I quickly grabbed the 20 pounds and of course checked it. Then I rang them up but as I had their change ready I saw one hand through the hatch. I dropped their change into that hand avoiding contact. Okay thank you bye now. I stared at them down. They finally left for good. As soon as they were gone I fell to the floor and burst out crying after holding in that fear for so long. I demanded that my shifts be changed to morning shifts after that night or I'm quitting. 